If you cut yourself, you heal, unless you're unlucky enough to cut off a whole finger. Then it doesn't come back. But if you're a flatworm, you can lose your head and regrow a new one. We're here at the Whitehead Institute in Cambridge to talk to MIT professor Peter Redine about how flatworms and other things can grow whole new body parts. Welcome to Simply Science from Nature Education. I'm Adam Weiss, and I'm here at the Whitehead Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts with Peter Redine, a professor of biology at MIT, who looks at regeneration. And I want to find out, I guess really simply, what happens when I cut my finger and I can heal that wound with finger and not with nose. And then at some point, you know, you look at, I guess, these little worms that can not just heal a cut finger, but can regrow a head, right? That's right, yeah. So. You're touching on a, a really central question in how animals regenerate, which is how do they know what part of their body is missing? If you cut your finger, how do you know you're missing a little piece of your finger? Or if you look at any animal that regenerates well, you can ask, how do they know what cells to make? We look at this uh, in uh, this animal you have here, planarian flatworms. And these worms, very much smaller than a worm that you'd think of, you know, finding in the ground, but th these are the kind of worms that can, if you cut off their head, they'll have a new head and the head will turn into a new worm, right? Right. Uh, this is what the planarians are famous for. They're, they're capable of regenerating any missing part of their body. You cut off their head, a new head grows back. You cut off their tail, you get a new tail. You take a tiny piece, about one three hundredth the size of the animal, and that will regrow an entire animal through this process of regeneration. So how many worms do you get if you cut one off? <laughs> well, if you, if you cut it in half, you get two. Both halves will regenerate the appropriate missing type and you get two complete animals. But you can cut them into many pieces. We've generated easily eight or nine planarians from cutting one animal into multiple parts. Okay. And what I'm going to do is take the knife and remove its head through amputation, which it will happily regenerate. have two pieces here. This piece will regenerate its tail. This piece will regenerate its head. So how does it do that? What, how does it know a tail versus, you know, it, you, I could definitely see just wild regeneration, it, it not knowing what to do. You cut it up, up into pieces and you end up with an animal with six tails and no head. Mm -hmm. How does it know? <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a fascinating question. And the way we try to answer is by looking for genes that are required for certain types of regeneration. And we have found several. For example, we've found a gene that is required for knowing whether to regrow a tail or a head. If we inhibit this gene, instead of regenerating a tail, the animal will regenerate a head in its place. For example, if we cut off the head of an animal and the tail of the animal in which we've inhibited this gene, we'll get a two-headed animal with both heads facing opposite directions, pulling at the same body. So, so one on each end, fighting to go in different directions. Exactly. <laughs> And you're trying to figure out how it works, not how to make it happen, right? We're, you, you aren't doing research in your lab to go from cutting my finger and regrowing to cut or, cutting my finger off and regrowing, right? right. We're, we're, just, we're taking the basic science approach of, of trying to look at an animal that does it well um, and ask, what do they do? Uh, once, my feeling is once we understand some of the key mechanisms that happen in animals that regenerate really well, at that point we can ask the question, What's different about those mechanisms in us uh, or other organisms that don't regenerate as well? They will pull themselves in, in half. And uh, you know, I, I sometimes tell a new, new student in the lab who's looking down the microscope with their knife to, to do the experiment where they cut them in half for the first time. And, and if they, they're hesitating and they're a little worried about it, I say, well, it's like sex for them. They're reproducing <laughs> this way anyway. So. Um, these animals are, are great for studying this because they have some uh, very useful properties for studying them in the lab. Easy to make a lot of them, first of all, right? It's easy to make a lot of them. So we have tens of thousands of them in the lab, so we can do a lot of experiments. They regenerate quickly. They can regrow a new head in under a week. And so uh, if we come up with an idea right now, we can go up to the lab, amputate them in a certain way, and next week we'll have the answer as to what happened. That's very important for doing experiments in, in the lab. In addition, we have tools now that allow us to inhibit genes. So we can essentially shut, down, shut off any gene we want in these animals and ask what goes wrong if we amputate those animals. That's how you ended up with the two-headed worm. Exactly. 
And using this type of approach, we can find not only these sort of information genes that instruct heads, tails, or other parts of the body, but we can also find genes that mediate communication, we hope, between wounds and stem cells. So stem cells in these animals are what are driving the new tissue, that is the, the production of new tissue. And so uh, we can use these animals to try to find those genes that are critical for stem cells to work and for wound signaling to stem cells to occur. So with those pieces of information put together, you can use these as a model for all sorts of stuff and learn about us as well as worms and salamanders and anything else. Definitely. Well, great, thank you very much. You're welcome.